All right, <clears throat> I think we'll get started. Um, welcome to Design for Drupal Boston 2020. Uh, this is our 12th anniversary uh, and this is our August webinar. So instead of, unfortunately, we weren't able to have an in-person conference this year. Um, instead, we're going to go through the entire year and have a webinar a month um, to bring the best of design and front end um, to the Design for Drupal audience. Today, we're excited to have Jason here to talk about getting graphic, reinventing design with type on the web. Uh, and we'll get to Jason's introduction in a minute. But thanks for joining us, Jason. Oh, thank you. So we're excited to have everybody. For those of you who weren't, who weren't able to make it uh, back in June um, to our one day, um, on June 10th, we had a one day, uh, Christina Chumulus uh, did a great keynote on design, usability, accessibility, and compatibility, uh, meeting the cha challenges of today's world with the Claro admin theme. Uh, there is a link to the recording. If you go to YouTube and search for Design for Drupal, you'll be able to find the recording of that keynote uh, in case you missed it. We also on that day had a 24 hour global contributions um, day. Uh, you can still contribute to Drupal 9. There's a couple Slack channels we put on the slide here. There's the admin UI, it's under the Drupal Slack. So the admin UI, if you wanna help contribute to the Claro theme and also D9-theme channel, if you wanna to contribute to Olivero. Um, and Mike Herschel gave a great webinar last month on the Olivero theme. And again, that, that uh, recording should be up on YouTube. Uh, so everybody's welcome to join, to contribute going forward, you know, whether you're design, front end, theming, you know, coding, documentation, whatever you might, you know, might be interested in, even testing, accessibility, everybody can contribute in some way. So join those channels, reach out, and just say, I'm here to contribute, how can I help? And somebody there will, will help you uh, select something to work on. Uh, the upcoming webinar series uh, next month, in sep on September 9th, um, we're thrilled to have Miriam Suzanne back. She spoke at Design for Drupal, she keynoted, I believe, two years ago. She's going to be speaking on CSS is rad, so we're excited to have Miriam back um, in September. Uh, in November, Johanna Bates and Clayton Dewey are going to be speaking on Consentful UX. You can sign up for the webinars on the designfordrupal.org website. Uh, we are still looking for to fill slots in October and December, so if you know somebody that um, would be a good fit for Design for Drupal Boston, uh, please reach out and let us know. Uh, <clears throat> Drupal is, the community of Drupal is one of the awesome strengths of the project. Um, there is a camp coming up um, this week, uh, August 14th to 16th. It's a virtual camp. It's Drupal Camp Colorado. <clears throat> there are trainings, there are uh, sessions, there's a contribution day there as well. So to, to look Drupal Camp Colorado and, you know, join that event as well. Uh, New England Drupal Camp, Ned Camp is on November 6th. We're doing something a little bit different this year. It's going to be a virtual BOFCON. BOF stands for birds of a feather. So it's where <clears throat> people that have similar interests can get together and talk about a particular uh, subject area, um, you know, in Drupal or in, you know, uh, the technology, uh, the Drupal users. So feel free to go check out the Neb Ned Camp website. Uh, and sign up to lead one of those boffs if you have a um, something that you'd be interested in leading a, a group of discussion on. There's a community events page on drupal.org. Just go to drupal.org and look up community events and there you can go and um, find out all the vir virtual events that are happening globally um, around the world. And then there's local meetups in your area. The Boston Drupal meetup meets the first Tuesday of the month, but there are virtual events you know, all over that you can now join. Um, the Drupal Association, we're trying to grow the Drupal Association. So, uh, you know, sign up for the Drupal Association on drupal.org. Drupal Association, you know, does the infrastructure for Drupal um, and a lot of other things, sponsoring attendees to camps and DrupalCon and they do a lot of great things. So take a look at them. And also remember the voting is now open for the, the next community elected board member for the Drupal Association. So um, check that out um, and uh, vote. Actually, it's the voting is not open yet. I, I misspoke here. 
the self-nomination for those who want to run to be an elected board member of the Drupal Association is now open. So I will fix this slide. Uh, the last thing, the code of conduct. Yes, this is a virtual webinar. Uh, we ask that everybody follow um, Drupal's code of conduct. There's a link on the footer of the website. Uh, if there are any concerns, reach out to myself. Uh, my number is there, 9084 Drupal, or reach out to Patrick Corbett at the same number. Um, we accept, expect everybody to treat, you know, everybody that participates in the, the Q&A, um, you know, with respect and not have any issues with the code of conduct. Uh, thank you to our sponsors. A quick thank you to them. Uh, Redfin Solutions, Lullabot, McPhee Design, AGI, Dev Collaborative, Oomph, Isovera, Talking Drupal, 108 Degrees, Oddbird. Uh, so thank you to all the digital sponsors. Without you, we wouldn't be able to have this webinar series. And finally today, uh, the chat feature is turned off on Zoom. We're gonna be using the Q&A feature to add questions during the webinar. So hop on, add your questions. We'll answer them all at the end. Uh, if there's anything, you know, relevant to something that's being presented, we may, you know, pop up a question during the presentation, but more than likely we'll be doing all those at the end of the, of Jason's presentation. So remember chat is off, use the Q&A tab. And with that, we are ready to have Emma introduce Jason. And thank you again, everybody for joining us. We're, we're thrilled to have all of you here. Graphic designers have customized layouts and title pages in magazines for decades, but between the limited technology of the early web and our race to systemize design once we had sufficiently capable technologies, we've missed out on much of what good graphic design has to offer. Now that we've designed our systems, polished our patterns, and perfected our pages, it's finally time to refocus on the specifics. With scaling typographic systems, we can leverage the power of modern CSS and variable fonts to create compelling, unique design variations tailored for the content they render. In this talk, Jason will look at powerful examples of publication design and explore how many of those concepts can be incorporated in our own work in compelling and sustainable ways. Take it away, Jason. Thanks, Emma. And thanks, uh, Leslie, for that, uh, for, for having me here and everybody involved in, in D4D. Um, I've been, oh gosh, I've been involved in, in speaking and, and helping with D4D, not all of its 12 years, but I think pretty close, maybe 10. Um, so it's, uh, I always have kind of a soft spot for, for this event and um, I'm really happy to be a part of it again this year. Great, thanks, Jason. Oh sure, my pleasure. So, um, I'm I'm going to be talking about and showing you um, a few different things, and uh, and this is going to take a little bit different uh, format than what I have done in the past, um, and and that's for for a couple of reasons. One, um, everything I'm showing you. Uh, with the exception of a few um, photos of publications is all stuff that's living in the browser, most of it on live production websites. So um, showing you what variable fonts are and what they can do and, and what we can do with them, particularly when pairing it with a system as powerful as Drupal is I, I think much, much better shown than described. So the first thing I'll, I'd, I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what is the technology that's driving this. So um, variable fonts is the technology I've, excuse me, been carrying on about them for almost four years. Um, they were first introduced in September of 2016 as an evolution of the open type specification. And over the years, I've been working with font vendors, um, software companies, browser teams uh, to help iron out issues with the implementation of variable fonts and, uh, and then to, to help popularize them and start to get them into use on, on some live projects. So um, I'm gonna borrow a little bit from a talk I gave earlier and, and some of you may have seen a little bit of this, but I was yelled at for not including some of this in my, in my past talks. So I hope you'll bear with me. Um, assigning, uh, or I'm sorry, explaining what a variable font is um, again, if you've installed fonts in the past, 
you've had to go through a process of installing a whole bunch of separate files and the real power of the variable font format is it can combine all these different axes of variation, width, weight, uh, slant, italic, optical size, almost anything that the type designer could think of can be combined into a single file. Now, that one file might be quite a bit bigger than a single instance, but it may still be better than what we're already loading. So that has been borne out in a couple of projects that I've worked on, but let's come back to seeing what kind of differentiation we can get. And so I'm going to enlist Tristan and Tilly, my favorite pups and walking companions in the morning. Uh, Tristan's on the left and Tilly's on the right. And when we talk about these axes of variation, I thought these two different sized collies might help us out a little bit. So you can see how the width axis might work or possibly weight. Uh, you could even have an X height axis. Um, again, that's uh, whatever the type designer has chosen to expose. And then of course, we can't forget slant. And the difference between slant and italics is really kind of, uh, it's interesting and it's not one that I knew a whole lot about um, until I started digging into this format. Slant is commonly seen in uh, generally sans serif typefaces and is a continuum. You can slant it a little bit or a lot and sometimes there's even more than one direction. What you see here, an italic, is not only an angle but also glyph substitution. So you see the G and the A are a slightly different form than were we to turn this off, um, we'd have a slightly different, uh, different look. Now, optical size is one that I mentioned that I think is really important. You might have missed what just happened there. So I'm gonna back up, I'm gonna show it to you again. Watch the type on the right and see how the stroke contrast all of a sudden got much more delicate. So dating back hundreds of years, in the practice of cutting metal type, it became pretty commonplace for a physically smaller type to be cut with slightly thicker strokes. So less contrast, less thick and thin. And so that was in order to have this lead metal type on cheap uh, or, or coarse paper with inks that weren't quite as refined would, could still print legibly at that small size. But at a large size, we wanted to emphasize that detail. So that was a way of having a single typeface work at different physical sizes slightly differently. So you'll notice, again, I'm gonna back up and go forward. Notice it's not just um, the stroke contrast, but also the spacing. So as, a, as the optical size value increased, the spacing decreased and the stroke contrast increased. So those things all kind of work in tandem. And the type designer has thought all these things through and they've exposed a value range that allows us to make this type work better at different sizes. Well, we lost that in the translation from uh, metal type into photo type setting and then into digital type, because what ended up happening was they would just uh, essentially digitize one outline and then scale it. And, and so that was the way they uh, were able to create type that freed us from the metal variety and let us set it at any size that we want, but we lost a nuance there. So this was a way to help bring that back. So these are all some examples of live type in the browser working and, and doing all these things. Um, I think that because if we have that single asset in place of loading four or five different individual fonts, we now have the opportunity to then leverage that in our design. So instead of only having regular and bold, which might correspond to 400 and 700 in weight, we could instead use a range uh, for one of the uh, typefaces that I'm using, especially this one here in the title, that actually has a weight range that goes from one, oh, there we go, uh, goes from one to 1,000. So not 100 to 900, it goes all the way from one. So we can get this really thin hairline that goes all the way out to something really heavy. And we'll look at, at more ways we can dig into that. But what that started to, to suggest to me was that with a tool like Drupal, we could start to put design back into the publishing process by exposing some of these controls because we can get at this all with CSS. So writing out a tiny little style sheet as the output of an admin control 
is actually something that's relatively easy to do. So that got me thinking about how can we start to bring more of the flair and panache that you see uh, in, uh, in really great print design into what we're doing on the web without giving up what we need on the web, which is the speed and ease of publishing. We have a design system that can work with any content we throw at it. We would really like to then be able to customize things a little bit for the specific content that we're publishing at the time. So I'm going to show this to you in four covers and four stories. And before I go into the first one, I want to flip over to uh, some, a couple of things that I photographed to, to show you. This is a layout from The Guardian. And one of the things that, that strikes me looking at a nicely designed newspaper is if we look at this carefully, there's one type style for the logo, but then they have different styles all around. So they've got the most important story. Uh, they've got some secondary stories, some third level ones down at the bottom. Uh, they've got a different treatment for opinion pieces on the right. They've got this big drop cap and a much lighter weight here. Uh, so they have give different ways of treating type throughout the page. But what happens more often than not is when we do this on our own, we end up with something like this. There's very little hierarchy. You kind of know what's more important, uh, but it's not really clear and it's certainly not particularly interesting. So what I'm going to show you throughout these, these variations of this cover is not changing a single line of the HTML. It's only about making choices in the layout, which is triggering different bits of CSS. So while this is a, a more static way of showing this, you can pretty easily imagine tying this into um, a, a paragraph component or, or some other way that you're adding content to the page and building in some design controls so that the editor or a designer who is working on the website could start to make some choices. So instead of looking like this, we could actually take a page from a, a nice magazine design and maybe make it look a little bit more like this, where we've got a big photo layered in the back that's coming from that main story. There's absolutely no question in our mind, but that this is the most important piece of content on the screen right now. And then we've got a second level set of stories here on the right, and then smaller sort of third level ones down in the bottom. Now pushing this even further, I mean, you could certainly uh, make some additional decisions about how you enforce contrast, um, but there's lots of other ways that we can do that. This is simply layering a scanned image in the back. There's nothing being done to modify that in any way, shape or form, but we could do something like apply an SVG color filter. And that would be something that can be present in the page and is just referenced when we add this photo. So it's non-destructive, it's really quick, and then we can layer something else on top of it and be sure that we're getting the, the kind of contrast that we need to make sure it remains accessible to everyone. So this is again, the same HTML, and this is also still the same typeface. Uh, this is a, uh, in, in both views, uh, all three views, we've been seeing excuse me, um, a, an upcoming release of Proxima Nova as a variable font that has a width and a weight axis. And just to make sure that we throw the extra a little bit in here, this is being shown in Firefox. If you look in the Firefox developer tools, and hopefully this is coming through well, I've selected the H1 and there's a fonts tab that we can use that will then load up anything about that typeface that we can vary. And you can see that we have these different axes here. It actually tells us what font is in use. And if I wanted to kind of play around with this in the browser, I can then actually see how that looks. So I've added a bit of a delay in here for the transition. So it's gonna slow things down a little bit, but you can see when I click over here and wait for that to load, you can see what a difference that makes. This, this range all comes right from within the font. So the designer of this typeface has decided to allow a weight range of 100 to 900, a width range of 50 to 100, and that's expressed as a percent using the font stretch attribute. And you can even go from regular to italic. He set this up as a range. Notice this A 
has changed. So he's actually set that up on a continuum so we can set the angle, but when I lower it below the halfway point, it gets a little bit more upright. Uh, wait for this to catch up here. I'll go back this way. Uh, now you'll see that it's gone back to that sort of two-story A. So all of these things can be built right into the typeface to give us that much more flexibility when we want to use them. And if we wanted to get even a little bit uh, more of a departure, um, we could even get a little crazier. And I'm just going to back up here. There we go. Um, so this is loading in a different typeface. This is obviously from Ono, which is, um, I think this was available on future fonts. Um, but this is just applying a, bl a mixed blend mode. Um, so to get that texture coming through from the image below, uh, we can add a drop shadow to it here so we can still preserve a little bit more uh, distance between the text and the image underneath. But it creates a really interesting effect that again, is something that comes right from the CSS. It doesn't alter the text, and it's an effect that we can simply choose and modify through the admin. So again, these are four different views of looking at this sort of cover design idea um, that we could enable as a choice when people are designing or, or, or publishing their content. So the idea here is that rather than have only one way of doing things, why not build a few different options into the publishing process so that we can then create some uniqueness on a daily or, or monthly or weekly basis, whatever the choice may be, um, to create a much more engaging experience without sacrificing performance, without sacrificing usability or accessibility. Now, that's sort of the cover idea. And if we go back and look at a couple of these images, um, we can start to see other layout ideas that might creep in. Uh, so this might be a really interesting cover idea. Well, we can do something like that pretty easily using either a mixed blend mode or a clipping mask. Um, so those things are actually tried and true. Um, I have a whole bunch of different uh, ways to play around with this stuff on CodePen. Um, so there's, there's tons of different examples there. All of them are really easy to build into a publishing process like Drupal. So you could have uh, the image automatically get added as a data attribute to the title and then actually feed that in as a clipping mask. And I'll show you an example of that as well uh, in, in the live version. But let's come back here to see where might we go with the stories. So I, I, I want to show you a few different ways that, that these will work, and then I've got a whole host of other, other tabs full of interesting things for you to take a look at, and we can see how more of this stuff works. So again, um, we end up doing a lot of things sort of like this. Um, we might have a bit of an exaggerated scale between the heading and the subheading and the body copy. Um, you know, we have an image that we've added to our, our text, but there's not really anything particularly groundbreaking going on. And it's usually just one after another of all following exactly the same layout. Where if we started to, again, build in a few different switches or ideas um, where we can give people some choice. And one, you know, one article might be published looking like this and another one might work a little differently. So we have a bigger image and then a lighter weight, narrower text layered over the top. And then maybe the subtitle gets floated to the left. So the text starts to wrap around and, and we create a little bit more of an great engaging tension in that layout that grabs people's uh, attention just a little bit more. Because there, there's something that I didn't uh, really bring up yet, which is the idea of the job that typography has to perform on your site. And by and large, over the years, I've really focused very heavily on one particular job, which is making reading easier. So making it easier to consume that content on the website and take in that information in an easy and meaningful way. But there's another side to that coin. There's another kind of job that typography has to perform. And sometimes that's to make it harder. 
we want to slow people down. We want to get their attention and make them work a little bit because they'll retain that message maybe just a little bit more. Now, you don't want to do that for a whole page, but for a headline, that's what gets people's attention. When you see a newspaper, when there's a, a big breaking headline and that masthead goes all the way across, you stop and you look. So even though we might do something like wrap text around, uh, in this case, we've, we've used a CSS shape that is actually going around that headline. It actually scales pretty well. I've done that in a few different places on my own site and a couple others where all you've got to do in the publishing process is maybe paste in one line of CSS that has a custom shape. I'll show you how that works. Um, it's really a pretty quick thing to teach somebody how to do, especially when you've got design tools like what Firefox has built into the browser. So I've, again, I've selected the H1. Down here, you can see there's a shape outside declaration and there's a little icon next to the polygon. And if I click on that, there we have it. So we can actually go back here and drag these things around if we want to. We can grab any one of these points and we could move it. That's a terrible demo to have for in, the, in the middle of a middle of a talk, but um, you can see it actually updates here live. And I will just back up and refresh so we can show this the way it's supposed to look. Uh, but it's really quick and easy to teach somebody how to tweak those things, copy those values, paste it into a field that you then write out as a line of CSS. So we can have things that are fully automated or we can have things that require a little bit of manual intervention. I've worked with both depending on the client to figure out what is the best workflow for them. Um, I'm a big fan of something like this uh, because it really creates this wonderful interaction between these two text elements. Um, and if we go back to um, one of these examples, something like this, if we opened up the line height and drew the boxes around each line and went all the way back, you could have a, a wonderful interplay between heading and subheading, or maybe let the body copy actually wrap around inside. So we can really have a lot of fun with that and create something that is, is incredibly unique, but will still scale because you're using M values and percentages. And then, um, as it gets smaller, you can just drop that out and let the text drop below. So it's, it's pretty easy for, that was not a nice way to put it. Um, everything takes skill and effort, but it's attainable. It's attainable in a systematic and sustainable way. That's really the point that I wanted to get across. Um, what's easy for one person or another is sort of irrelevant. But um, when we look at these examples, this one in particular, it gets me thinking about what grabs your attention? What is the job that typography is performing here? And there's no doubt what the title is. It doesn't matter that it's not the first thing that you see. It's the most attention getting, so it's okay. Someone will put the effort into reading that. And, and that's why even doing things like this, someone's still going to tilt their head and read that and they might retain it just a little bit longer because it actually took them a second longer to get there. Um, again, all of these things are one typeface. Um, we're just altering width, weight, and, and italic along the way. Um, we're using some selector rules for the first paragraph and the first line to add a, few, a little bit more nuance and finesse to the, the opening paragraph of the story. Um, but all of these things actually work really nicely together excuse me, um, to create an impact along the way that, uh, you know, we're tying into a slightly different image filter. Um, it's all about creating an impact in a way that is sustainable. So we pick the filter that we want. We pick from some predefined styles or even add some sliders in so that in the publish act of publishing, we save some values that can, that then get written out um, as a little style sheet when the, when the site gets, gets loaded. Um, all of those things actually work really nicely with the structured publishing process that Drupal supports. <clears throat> so there we go. Um, now this isn't the end, but I wanna point out, um, we have a link that's going out for slides um, and there's a whole bunch of resources here as well. 
Um, I know that they'll be pushing this out um, into, uh, well, I guess maybe not chat, but um, out to everybody on the website and all of that. So um, don't worry, you can get back to all of these things. There's tons of resources there. What I really wanted to do was come back and show you some of the resources that I've worked on and put into production using variable fonts. So this is a website that I worked on as variablefonts.io. Um, this was commissioned by the Google Fonts team. So this was created. Um, I did the, all of the writing and, um, and demos and everything on here. And this is just sort of intended to kind of show you some of these things in action so that you can see some of the things that are going. This is recursive. A uh, website that uh, by Stephen Nixon at Arrowtype that is also available on uh, on the Google Fonts platform. You can get tons of variable fonts um, from the Google Fonts platform. You do need to do a little bit of work to get the range out of them on the API, but that's part of what this site is all about. So, uh, if you look at the designing of the web fonts uh, with variable fonts page, you'll see similar to what I showed you earlier. There's lots of explanation and demos of each of these axes. So you can kind of see live, what does the CSS look like? What's it look like up here? What's it doing? Um, why you would want to use any of these things. Um, so we've got width. Um, and then, you know, these examples of like upright versus italic. Um, and then, you know, ones that actually go uh, like slant here with a range. So you can actually control that in a much more granular way. So those are some of the standard, uh, standard ones showing you some of the examples of optical sizing, for example. So you can kind of play with that and see what the differences are there. Um, and then some of the combinations where you can actually work with slant and italic separately. So you can see you can control the angle and then the glyph substitution is totally separate. So you can see those things change as we toggle this one on and off. So every type designer is going to work with this a little bit differently. So when you get the variable font, it, it pays to learn how it works. Um, so there's a little bit of exploration there. But generally speaking, um, browser support is excellent. Um, IE 11 will not support them, but you can use uh, at supports in your CSS to serve static variable fonts for older browsers, and then variable fonts that uh, with browsers that support them, which at this point is over 90% of the devices connected to the web in the world. So um, all the recent versions over the last couple of years of Edge, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, um, so all of the major ones as well as iOS and Android. Um, so there are a few Android browsers that are primarily in the Asian market that uh, don't support them, but that number is going down all the time. Um, the axes themselves are what is supplied by the type designer. So there's no artificial distortion. The browser won't try and create something that's not there. Um, and the interesting thing is sort of the, uh, the availability of custom axes. The type designer can create any sort of custom axis they want and make those available um, using font variation settings. A lot of the other things tie into existing CSS. So we have font weight, which can simply get a number instead of a keyword. Font stretch is a percentage. Uh, it's supposed to be 100% is the normal width. That number range might vary based on the type designer and how closely they follow the spec, but that's how you would express it in CSS. Um, Font optical sizing is a new attribute that's supported in all the shipping browsers right now. Um, so you can set that to auto or you can use font variation settings and set it to a specific number. Um, so if you want to force it to a high or low value, which is similar to what I did in this screen. Um, so you can see these are a similar size, but I've used small caps for the words chapter one and I've forced the uh, optical size value lower and then force it higher for the word loomings. So even though this is the same typeface, the same type size, you get a different feel for it based on the tweaking of those values. So that's how you can kind of create a real more, a more interesting interplay between those two elements. Um, 
The implementation page over here has a whole uh, section on how you would write your at font face rules, um, how you request them from the Google Fonts API, um, and, uh, and how you would uh, go about, excuse me, um, either, either, I'm sorry, getting them through the Google Fonts interface versus getting them through the API and then writing your own self-hosting rules. Um, for now, personally, I think you get the best um, performance out of um, hosting it yourself it gives you the greatest control, but um, the API from Google is really quite good. Um, their catalog is growing all the time. And so as long as you get used to how you have to write out that, um, that syntax to request the full range instead of a single value, um, it's a great place to experiment and get your feet wet with them. There are plenty of open source ones that you'll find there that you could then also find the source on GitHub and use them yourself. Um, they might have more of the open type features that I like to use with different number styles and ligatures and things like that that are often stripped out when they serve them from Google. Um, so I know uh, we want to kind of get towards some Q&A and I, I can see the questions starting to come in. So I'd like to just run through a couple of other things that I, I think you would find interesting um, beyond uh, this website. So it's variablefonts.io. Um, it also has some resources here available. Um, and the About This Site page is actually a pretty in-depth look at why we did what we did here and how we're making use of the variable fonts in, uh, on this website. And one, one thing that I uh, will point out is we're also leveraging this to work well with dark mode. Um, so that can actually be supported automatically. So I have this little toggle here to flip myself over into dark mode and without having to do much of anything, this, the website actually reacts on its own. Um, and I've done a, a pretty fair degree of, of testing to make sure that it maintains the color contrast, although that right there is definitely not passing. Um, but all of that stuff is relatively easy to build into your CSS, especially when you're working with the sort of modern trifecta of uh, using variable fonts, using uh, CSS custom properties and calculations is a great way to support all of these things together and only have a small chunk of variables to reassign when you want to support that inverted color mode. So that's so some fun things to play with on this site. Uh, the whole repo is actually available on, on GitHub so you can get the whole site and take a look at that. Um, most of the things that I'm showing you are available in that same way. Um, so another thing, uh, if you uh, subscribe to my email newsletter, um, Web Typography News, I've been actually going through this project for the last few months of typesetting Moby Dick. Um, so I've got the whole book here. The whole thing is available through the you know, table of contents. We'll let you get through any chapter. But one of the things that I did recently was in addition to supporting dark mode, um, I've also built in some other accessibility controls that I think are really worth thinking about um, as we are working towards better and more inclusive design on the web. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at this. Um, we can actually build in things that alter the font size uh, or maybe increase the line spacing for somebody that uh, would just have an easier time reading that way. Uh, for some people, even spacing out the words helps them read a little bit better. So. Uh, this was kind of an experiment to see how many things could we put in here in a meaningful way to make the typography that much more flexible. Um, but if you go to mobydick.wales, W-A-L-E-S, um, the whole book lives there and there's a, a, a link to go find it on GitHub and, and you can see all the things that are going on there with the variable fonts, with the scaling typography. Um, the typography is actually scaling using clamp now. Uh, to set a minimum and a maximum value and a scaling value in between. And so as this goes from small screen, you can see the typography all scales to be more consistent and, and useful for people based on the size of the device upon which they're reading. Um, uh, I had mentioned more of these experiments that I was showing you um, about the same underlying content, but having some fun with the layout just by adding a little bit more CSS 
you can see some of the origins of these experiments are all over on CodePen. Um, this one I, I really enjoyed doing where just using word break, break all, uh, with the text contained inside this square means that it might reflow differently on different screen sizes, but people will still figure it out. And it's a really interesting effect that will get people's attention. And it's one that is very, um, uh, very sustainable in that you can change the photo, you can change the text. This, this effect is going to work um, really pretty much the same way. Um, and then to push that a little bit further with this one, um, using CSS columns, as well as a few other little, little tidbits here and there um, to uh, see what we could do for a more interesting layout experience to more closely mimic um, kind of the printed word. Um, this is another one, uh, again, also on CodePen. Uh, it's a single typeface. Uh, this is using Amstel var to get all the different variations that we see here. Um, Mstel var is a little quirky. It's more of an experiment than necessarily a polished typeface, but um, it does have a ton of variability to it. So that one is really worth, worth a look. And uh, this experiment was just trying to see what could we do to make news sites a little more interesting. So this is actually layering a photo with some transparency over the type uh, just to see what kind of impact we could get as that reflows, um, but using a little bit of CSS grid you know, I think we've come up with a, a fairly interesting layout that actually stays interesting even as it evolves um, from one screen size to another. And so, you know, our newspaper websites don't have to be boring. Um, they could have a lot of variability built into them. Um, and then uh, finally, before we sort of kick over, um, I wanted to, to briefly show this one because this is a Drupal project. So the georgia.gov web platform is something I helped Lullabot with uh, last year and the year before, um, working on the typography and the color palette options. So they're able to build up their sites with all of these components. Um, and then if you go to uh, um, other um, sites within that network, they might have different coloration, um, but they're getting a lot of similar typography and a lot of the similar kind of component-based approach uh, everything reflows and recolors really nicely. And this is using a lot of the same scaling typography and a variable version of source serif for the primary typeface. So um, uh, this is all built out using Layout Builder and Pattern Lab as part of a Drupal theme. Um, and and we, we worked on that uh, together for quite a while to ensure that they'd be able to use it on all 80 different sites throughout their, their government network um, without any uh, real sacrifice to how unique each of them can feel with all of the flexibility in these different design components. So, so that's, uh, that's what I want to encourage you to do is, is look at graphic design, look at print design, look at magazines, um, start to think about ways you could leverage that single asset that you're loading or one or two font files that would allow you to build some of that flexibility into the publishing process. Um, a little bit goes a long way. Um, one of the things that we started with on, um, on this particular site, the live broadcast site for the Bleacher Report, was actually just focusing in on performance. So we replaced eight different font files with two variable fonts, and we took about 350K of font data away from the load process. So they've got lots of other things going on, but fonts are not one of the things slowing them down. So um, this was a good starting point for us to really overhaul the performance and how they're loading the stuff that will then let us access all of the, the weight range in these typefaces to start to create a stronger hierarchy and, and more flexible um, experience for them going forward. So I think uh, it's time for some Q&A. Thank you so much, Jason, for that talk. Um, that was really great and we all appreciate it very much. I will now turn it over to Stephen to help moderate the Q&A. Jason, so we have our first question here from Irving. 
This was at about 1222, so earlier in your presentation. He says, so the font designer would have to build the fonts to be able to pull off flexibility. It's not possible with common fonts like Open Sans and Times New Roman? So it's sort of a yes and no kind of answer. Um, most fonts, most typefaces have been designed in a range of weights. So depending on when that was done, that will determine how easy or difficult it is to take that original font and then, excuse me, output it as a variable font that has the whole continuum of that weight range. So not all of them, or really most of them have not had that process happen. Some have, um, some typefaces are being designed from the ground up to work this way. But I think, uh, vfonts.com, v-fonts.com is a great place to see available variable fonts. Um, there are many of them out there and the more we use them here and on the Google Fonts platform and elsewhere, um, the more people realize that there's a market for them. So this is a little bit of cheerleading on my part. Um, I think they're incredibly useful from a performance and accessibility standpoint, but I, I think the real value is when we combine these things into um, effects that are multipliers. So we get a faster interface, we get a more accessible UI, and we can then expand our design voice and create much more interesting and engaging layouts. And, and that's where I think the real power is. So, so Monotype is putting out some variable fonts. You can find them on my fonts or fonts.com. Um, the Google Fonts UI has a checkbox right at the top in the main bar where you can search that says only show me the variable fonts. So you can, you can take a look at those. Um, they will only be the weight axis available uh, on, on Google fonts. Um, but uh, that is starting to change. Um, recursive is actually available with all five of the axes there. Uh, and it's a really fun typeface to look at. Um, that one's worth checking out recursive.design. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it is a process. So the type designer does have to do some work, but more and more people are putting that work in. Um, and, the, you know, we're now at least in the hundreds or, of, of variable fonts that are available and more are coming out all the time. Thank you. So David asks, is shadowing part of the built-in attributes? Um, so all of the shadowing that I've been doing here is just with CSS. Um, and so it's just using text shadow. Uh, sometimes I'm using multiple shadows to layer one in one direction that has more of a spread and then a harder shadow like you can see here on the word thanks um, is, is tighter in and, and down to the right. But um, that's, that's a technique that I like to use when I am unsure about the amount of contrast I'll have with an image. Um, so I can ensure that I create a lighter area or a darker area over the image so the text will have enough contrast and pop out. So Ruth asks, uh, what is the link to the resources? So Ruth uh, and anyone listening, you can go to Design for Drupal's website, uh, choose the webinar series, scroll down to Jason's presentation, and then we have a link there to the presentation slides and the resources. Jason, are there any additional resources that you'd like to mention? Well, sure. I mean, I, I tried to put, so if you go to this link on noticed where I have the, the slides, there's, there are also resources on that page and lots of the things that I would mention are already there. Um, I have a newsletter that I, I put out, uh, used to be weekly. It's a little less than that now, I'll be honest. But, um, but that is focusing on different web typography techniques in every issue. Um, I'm, on, I'm about to do issue number 50. Um, so there's lots of them and they're all archived on my own website, rwt.io. Uh, if you look under tips in the navigation, all of them are archived there. Um, I think those are, are kind of some of the main things that I like to encourage people to check out. But, um, but really there's more and more being written about them all the time. Um, if you look me up on CodePen, I've got oodles of demos there with lots of open type fonts that you can, uh, open source fonts that you can play with and, and take and use on your own. Um, I've got repos on GitHub that people can copy. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to grab stuff and play. Uh, and then if you have questions, just get in touch. I'm at Jay Palmentel pretty much everywhere. Vivian would like to know, is it better to have different variable fonts based on each content type 
or have one set of variable standards site-wide? I think that's a fascinating idea. Um, I think in general, I try and keep um, the typography fairly consistent across the site. I think that uh, the idea of having a different font or a different font treatment based on content type um, is certainly really interesting. I mean, a, very, a good variable font um, will have a pretty broad range of axes that you can play with. So uh, being able to do a lot with a single font file um, really opens up a lot of possibilities. So, you know, having, um, you know, something like Proxima Nova where you have a, a huge spread in weight and width as well as, as italic built into all that, that one file, um, you can do an awful lot without having to load any other assets. So that's a, that's a bit subjective, but, um, you know, I think uh, font files do have weight. Um, variable fonts are a little bit heavier than uh, a single instance. It's probably more like it's the same size as maybe two or three, uh, depending on, on the font. Um, so you don't want to load tons, but there's no reason not to load more than one. So Kelsey, who is a Figma user, is wondering if you have any suggestions for designers building in a program that doesn't support variable fonts yet. Is there a way to implement them in the meantime besides a live site? So unfortunately, it's a bit of a tricky conundrum. Um, I know that it's on Figma's roadmap. I, I've talked to them about it. I know that they're thinking about it. Um, you can use them in Sketch. You can use them in the Adobe Creative Suite. You can use them in Corel Draw. Um, you can also use them as installed system fonts. So there's the notion of what are called named instances. So even if the application itself doesn't technically support a variable font, you can still reach those named instances that might correspond to light italic or um, bold condensed, you know, like whatever those, those things might be. And that really targets instances along the way. So you could still reach that in Figma when you're looking at something on your local system. Uh, the problem will be, it's not gonna be quite the same. I tend to prototype those things separately. So I will create a test harness for type and, and work on all the responsiveness there and then marry those things together um, once you have the design starting to come into code. So it, it is an imperfect solution with Figma in particular, but take the opportunity to contact Figma's support and, and make your voice heard. The more people ask for it, the more priority it gets. And our last question is more of a comment from Sean, and I think it summarizes how many of us feel right now, which is, Jason, thank you for a nice explanation, and it makes me want to use them now. Well, that's, that's certainly my goal. And um, I, I, I've tried to get as many of these production projects out there so people can see these things are safe to put in production. Um, that stuff with the state of Georgia is in use and seen by three or four million people a week. Um, so we know it's production ready. We know it's fast. The Bleacher Report site's been using them for, for months now. Um, the Stripe redesign, uh, they just redesigned their identity and they're using their own custom typeface in a variable format on their website. Um, it's really a, a, a fairly straightforward process that's pretty well documented how to serve the static web fonts for the older browser, the variable fonts for the new browsers, and nobody ever downloads the same uh, an additional resource. So it's, it's still a pretty safe and reliable way to serve everybody who's coming to your site. We had one more question squeak in. Um, do they work well along with icon fonts, emojis, and other language fonts? So uh, I'll answer those a little bit separately. Um, right. I icon fonts, I've seen a couple of people experiment with this idea, and I think that this is an area sort of right for exploration uh, because there's no reason you can't make an icon font variable. And so when you think about how icon fonts work, oftentimes there are uh, 
different renderings of them based on intended usage. So reduce the detail and create more solid areas when they're really small and have more detail when they're big. So think of that as an optical size axis. So that would be really kind of an interesting way to have one variable icon font work at a much broader set of sizes. So there's no reason that you can't do that. I don't think there's any way to do that with emoji, but honestly, I have no idea. Emoji is such a, like a weird and different world. I don't, um, I don't claim any knowledge there. Languages though, I think that's really interesting um, because uh, the variable font format works with any font. So there are lots of typefaces that cover a broad set of language support that are variable. And one of the places where uh, they are being experimented with um, in, in really interesting ways is for uh, CJK languages, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And the thing there is that those typefaces often can be 16 to 20 megabytes. Um, so then when you turn that into a variable font, it might be considerably bigger. But when you pair that with what we're working on in the Web Fonts Working Group, uh, where I'm an invited expert, is a way to stream those fonts more effectively. So the ability to serve the portion of the font that you need to render this page and then another portion of the font when you go to another page and it sort of adds up to a more complete font on your local system, that's coming. You know, it's probably a year or two away, but these things are going to be a really powerful combination to help serve better typography in more places. Um, you can still achieve some benefits uh, depending on the language set. If the font that you want to use covers it, you could also work with different subsets. So if somebody is looking at primarily English language pages, maybe they only get one portion of the font file. Um, if you switch over to another language, um, maybe that's the key to load in another one. Um, so that way you can stagger the impact that it has on, uh, on people's systems. Excellent. I think that's all the questions. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining and thank you, Jason. Uh, it's always a pleasure for us to have you present at Design for Drupal. Like you said, you've been around since, you know, pretty much the beginning uh, of this conference. So we really appreciate you coming every year and sharing your information and your great tips and examples and, you know, really getting the word out there about the, the variable font. So uh, thank you very much. Um, just a reminder to go to designfordrupal.org and that's design the number four drupal.org. Uh, to sign up for our future webinars. Um, next month, we're looking forward to have Mar Miriam Suzanne back to uh, talk about CSS is Red. So thank you, Jason. Thanks everybody for joining us and we will see you next month. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks everyone. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>